Okay, very good morning, Monday 12th of July and congratulations to Italy for winning, beating England on penalties last night at the Euros and for England, a good run, uh, of course, best performance we've had reaching a major tournament final in 55 years and much to be proud of and if anything through that failure comes all the more greater motivation, determination to just get the job done and move that next step up come the World Cup, obviously, in literally just a year's time or so. So enough said on that, and I hope everyone is is <laughs> managing to um, get back to business this morning. And actually looking at markets, there's um, plenty going on this week. In terms of the weekend news flow, though, it was very quiet. There's a couple of pin- things to, to get you up to speed on from ECB President Christine Lagarde, some interesting comments that she made. There's also updates on on COVID, both the UK lockdown strategy and as well as COVID updates elsewhere in mainland Europe and Australia. Um, and also going to talk a little bit about uh, geopolitics, particularly that between the US and China still kind of simmering in the background, although not a major market influence in terms of moving price right now definitely warrants just being vigilant and watching that situation and then for this week there's a lot going on we've got u.s inflation data retail sales industrial production jerome powell gives his semi-annual testimony and u.s earnings season kicks off this week with the big u.s bank so plenty for us to to talk about but looking at the charts this morning um, Asia pack stocks generally beginning the week on the on the front foot nothing spectacular overnight but mildly positive uh, conformed to the positive mood generally seen in Chinese markets following the PBOC surprised reserve requirement ratio cut the triple R cut we had on Friday now just a quick look at the S&P 500 we have then, as we saw late last week after that really nice recovery uh, going into Friday session, initiated from the overnight Asia Pac trading session, and we have actually hit fresh all time highs in the overnight uh, trade, which came literally at the recommencement of, of trade. We've drifted a little bit south from there, finding a little bit of support from the previous all time highs that we were seeing uh, around Tuesday of last week, but still remaining very elevated. Uh, and that comes, of course, amid some of the slide that we did see in equities um, through a brief period at the beginning of last week, as we saw yields as well, seeing quite dif- distinctive movement to the downside. But Friday was actually the first day in, in several that the yield appreciation, if you like, did buck the trend. And T notes at the moment, bottom right, as you can see here, are trading basically flat going into this European market open. So you can see here the 10 years well off those highs that were seen um, in the middle of last week when we were trading up above 134 handle. We're now back down to 133.12 as far as the overnight session is is concerned. Currency-wise, the Dixie's a touch firmer this morning. Uh, Nothing massive, up about one-tenth of one percent. Just from a technical short-term perspective in euro dollar, just been keeping an eye on this trend line here going back to uh, price movement from the 30th of June had a retest on the 6th of July and back to where we were from late in futures trade on Friday and the overnight Asia pack high was around a similar price point. We've just drifted off a little bit as the dollars just picked up pace and through the back end of that session into the European Open. So uh, nothing really too dramatic here. I'm looking at from a technical perspective at the moment um, and likewise could really be said for cable. Uh, Cable Again, forming a short-term double top from that Friday overnight price activity and just forming a bit of a base here through that range of age pack from 139.13 down to 138.85 for the moment. On a daily chart for cable, we're in the kind of um, bottom side of that inflection point around 140 in sterling futures. Uh, So sitting pretty mid that range for the time being. Um, we'll have a look at some of the UK things that are coming out um, when we start looking at the calendar for the rest of the week, but also looking for another update from PM Johnson, of course, later on tonight to confirm the final unlocking for the UK economy on the 19th. And then elsewhere in the commodity space, um, in terms of gold, just from a technical perspective, I was just marking up a few things this morning and was just looking at this um, trend line going back to mid-June and then more short term from really last week that we've been respecting and just having a little test down towards the S1 here more recently in 
in gold, which is around that $1,800 uh, price point. Uh, any further decrease beyond that level, I'll be looking at $1,795 as, a, as an area of more stronger support, which would encapsulate, as you can see here, some of these previous areas of resistance turn support as well. And then for crude oil, no real major or any OPEC headlines to speak of. So after a lot of that toing and froing of what would happen with that supply agreement deal, things have gone a little bit more quiet on that front. Um, as far as oil is concerned, we just ran into a bit of a, uh, a short-term top at the recommencement of trade, which coincided with around that high that we had printed back on uh, last Tuesday. We've just drifted down uh, amid some of the renewed dollar strength as Europe has come in. So both oil and um, oil, gold and the major currency pairs all just reacting a little bit to the marginal strength in the dollar coming in. Uh, pivot seen just below around the 74 handle today. Uh, but again, nothing really technically to um, jump out uh, interesting in terms of where we're trading at the moment in oil. So let's get straight to it and start talking about the news because there's plenty to, to digest for the week ahead as well. Um, starting off with a, a piece that came out late last night, um, citing commentary from ECB President Christine Lagarde. And days after the ECB have raised its inflation goal to 2% and acknowledged it might overshoot that target, um, Lagarde said that the July 22nd governing council session, so 10 days from now, uh, previously expected to be a fairly uneventful, uninteresting event, will have some, quote, she said, some interesting variations and changes. Now, she expects the ECB's current 1.85 trillion euro bond buying plan to run till, quote, at least until March 2022. And then that can be followed by a transition into a new format, she said, without elaborating, though. The other comments of note, um, she said, we would need to be very flexible and not start creating the anticipation that the exit is needed in the next few weeks and months. So overall, you know, this is it with central bank commentary. It's a little bit cryptic in a way. Um, the headline Bloomberg are running is a little bit sensational I think trying to extract out some sort of hawkish element to what she was saying I don't really see it quite like that um, the bomb buying ending in that way I don't think it's unsurprising she's talked about as well not starting to create any anticipation of, of tightening uh, too rapidly so it's fairly balanced and and the two percent target we already know having had the confirmation on those details last week so I uh, just wanted to, to cover it. It's definitely not um, a factor, I think, that's influencing the euro this morning. Um, but she did appear on Bloomberg TV and, and, and Bloomberg themselves then having the exclusivity over that interview, I think, are just trying to squeeze the uh, the content of her speech to, to make the most of it. This would be my interpretation. Um, otherwise, moving over to, to the COVID side, um, in a news conference due later today, um, the PM is widely expected to confirm that mandatory curbs will be um, ending as planned on July 19th, including the legal requirement to wear masks uh, in indoor settings. Um, he'll also warn that unlocking will drive a new surge in cases. He's already kind of started to drip feed that in to the messaging from last week, as you'll remember, as has the newly appointed Health Secretary Sajid Javid talking about case races going case uh, rate uh, case rates going up as high as a hundred thousand in the summer, and so he's um, said that it will, people must take all responsibility in the coming weeks to help keep infections at manageable levels. Um, the UK uh, reportedly is to reduce the gap between taking the first and second doses of COVID nineteen vaccines as well to four weeks from eight. You remember originally these were twelve. Um, so as they look to accelerate that program, those time frames are getting increasingly shorter. Uh, they're also reportedly planning to require COVID-19 passports for customers to enter bars, restaurants and nightclubs, according to some of the UK media uh, at the weekend. So it does come, of course, a, a continued uptick in infections per day in the UK. Uh, and definitely will be continuing to monitor this number. Uh, also, the, the kind of tail effects of the Euro Championships having uh, happening in Wembley, as you've seen, with fully um, occupied kind of stadiums back to back to normal. It'll be interested to see how those numbers start to play out as we go further forward over the coming week or two. Uh, but this number, as already mentioned, is expected to um, triple basically in the in the weeks uh, and and kind of next two months to come. So um, I don't think it would be 
all that surprising and, and hence the reason why the pound's relatively controlled. But one thing is, the higher this number goes, then although those the, the rate given the demographic is much more proportionally lower than previous for hospitalizations and subsequent deaths, hospitalizations are going up at this point. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. While the UK goes into kind of full unlocking mode, so to speak, on the flip side, uh, the Dutch PM came out over the weekend and announced that COVID-19 curbs would be partially reimposed in the Netherlands um, from Saturday morning due to a surge in infections. And they're going to remain those restrictions in place until the 14th of August. And then jumping elsewhere, globally, Sydney is bracing for a longer and stricter lockdown having already seen it extended um, after continued increases in COVID-19 cases as well. So, yeah, just interesting to see then the difference in, in government strategy here. The UK kind of pushing ahead with this kind of self-coined Freedom Day, whereas um, in other pockets around the world with the Delta variant still causing um, noticeable upticks in case rates, they're opting for a more cautious approach for the time being. Um, from a geopolitical point of view, um, there was a few comments that, that were fairly interesting over the weekend. And one was that um, China said on Sunday it resolutely opposes the addition of 23 Chinese entities to the U.S. economic blacklist over issues alleged over human right abuses and, and military ties. Beijing went on to say that it will, quote, take necessary measures to safeguard China's legitimate rights and interests. And at the same time, we had um, other news that came out, which was which was basically this. And it was talking about the idea that um, China, their military apparently drove a US warship that illegally entered Chinese waters near the Par Parasol Islands on Monday. Um, and so, again, not that this is particularly new, and I wouldn't see this as like a step towards closer towards engagement in any type of way. It just goes to show, though, that tensions and friction between these two countries remains um, pretty tense at this point in time. Um, otherwise, let's just take a look at the week ahead. And got a calendar here, but I can talk you through some of the main things. And as you can see, on Monday's pretty quiet overall. Um, and so Tuesday is really where things start to, to pick up pace a little bit. And first off that you can see here is the U.S. inflation data. Big week for U.S. data, in fact. And for inflation, um, on Tuesday, it's expected to come in headline reading at 4.9%. Remember, we had that very high 5% reading in May. Um, the core reading is expected to see an uptick to 4%. Um, business executives have continued reporting brisk price increases according to the closely watched surveys we had in the last few weeks from the Institute of Supply and Management and those PMI numbers. Prices paid by manufacturing firms are rising faster than at any point since the late 70s, 1979 at the moment, with those paid by services companies rising at levels not seen um, since 2008. Also reading a few other bank commentary pieces, um, apparently used car uh, vehicles that continue or are set to continue to really elevate inflation prices. So it continues to play somewhat into one of those transitory components of the way of which CPI is composed. But you know how sticky and how high is inflation is still going to be key things to, to watch at the moment. But given some of the yield movement we've had over the course of the last week or so, the CPI kind of sting has probably been neutralized a little bit, albeit it's still a very important number and markets will likely still remain quite sensitive to it. Also as well, going through into Tuesday night into Wednesday, I think it's probably Tuesday night you'll get the prepared text and then he speaks on a Wednesday for the House and then uh, for the Senate on Thursday is Fed Chair Powell delivering his semi-annual testimony. Um, so you can see that here, top one on Wednesday. And analysts at ING make a couple of good points. They said the Fed made it clear that by moving to an average inflation target, they are prepared to allow the economy to run somewhat hotter with inflation temporarily running above target, as we've just discussed, and is likely to continue to do so this week. Um, and that's to ensure then that more people feel the benefits of growth. Um, so however, given the supply side strains in the economy, the likely timing of policy tightening is being brought forward, as we know, and he may offer Powell, this is, clearer hints that a tapering of QE asset purchases will start this year. So 
is this meeting a little bit too soon? A lot of people had obviously penciled in the Jackson Hole Symposium, which isn't coming for another five weeks or so until we get a little bit more definitive hints. So I'm a little bit on the fence with that. I don't think we're going to get too much from Powell on the giveaway with tapering, to be honest with you, this week. Um, and I think he's more likely to just wait, see how the market develops between now and Jackson Hole in five weeks' time, both from a actually meaningful yield movement like what we saw yesterday to see how markets' perceptions are and then also equipped with more economic data points that would have come in by that point about different pockets of the economy and how we're performing uh, to make that assessment. So power's important. I don't think it's going to be a real dead giveaway with more clear hints on, on tapering personally, um, but definitely the more um, specific on that than the more sensitive markets will be obviously in a negative way towards more faster acceleration to tightening and tapering uh, and then the opposite vice versa if um, he starts to push back against the idea of that discussion developing anytime soon um, the other thing is that we're going to get you can see here you've got uk inflation metrics as well coming out on wednesday um, expected to show an uptick to 2.2 percent um, year on year for june from the 2.1 percent in may for the headline do remember though i think when it comes to uk inflation the bank of england has said in its most recent policy meeting um, last month that while inflation was likely to exceed three percent it would later fall back and should not affect monetary policy and as such i think that yeah unless it's spectacularly out of line to the upside i think just um, inline readings 0.1 or two higher I don't think necessarily it's going to create too much of a destabilizing effect for market participants uh, kind of view around what the Bank of England are going to do with policy. They've already kind of bought themselves the wiggle room saying then in, in the period ahead, it's likely to go much higher than what it currently is um, expected to on this week's print. Um, otherwise, on, on Wednesday as well, you've got the RBNZ meeting. Um, going in overnight into into that day. The statement will be published alongside the decision. No change is expected at this meeting, but the statement will be assessed carefully for any hints of a potential hike this year. And then you've got the Bank of Canada as well, as you can see here in grey. Uh, they're set to announce another tapering of their QE asset purchases, reducing it to $2 billion per week from $3 billion, having already kind of staggered it down from $5 billion where it started. So Definitely going to be one to watch there from Canada. Then going into Thursday, um, you get the initial jobless claims, of course. Uh, we'll be tracking those as per usual. Worth noting that overnight in Asian trade, I think we've got trade date on Tuesday. But we've got GDP, retail sales and the like on Thursday from China. Um, in the first quarter of 2021, the Chinese economy expanded by an incredible 18.3%. But the unusually high rise, of course, has been driven predominantly by those low, low base um, effects at the start of 2020 due to the pandemic. And in a quarter and quarter terms, um, GDP rose just 0.6% for China, which was far below expectations. Um, so data released on Thursday from, from China is expected to show retail sales as well, growth of 12% on the year. Uh, and this data, um, of course, in focus, just given the surprise cut to the triple R that we had at the end of last week, which often historically kind of precedes then lower data points. So the Chinese government in preparation looking to get ahead of the game and add some liquidity to the system. This, um, and that certainly has helped stabilize things a little bit as far as the um, overnight session to start this week has been concerned in, in the Far East. Um, elsewhere then, going further forward um, beyond that point into Friday, you can see here you've got U.S. retail sales. So you know, lots of key data coming out of the States this week. The consensus view currently expects U.S. retail sales to have been unchanged in June versus the 1.3% the decline in May. Auto sales would like to be the culprit of the lackluster report. Um, analysts at Credit Suisse make some interesting observations. They said that citing high frequency data that the restaurant spending will continue to have picked up in June as the economy continues to reopen and leisure and hospitality um, are the biggest benefactors of that uh, in America. But goods consumption is likely to have declined. And of course, this comes after those stimulus check effects start to fade, having had those more show up in retail sales figures in both the beginning of the year uh, and in March as well. Um, one potential upside surprise, though, could come from non-store retailers. Do remember that Amazon Prime Day which is obviously a big shopping day, uh, was in June instead of the usual July event. 
Um, so something to be aware of. Uh, and then on Friday, you've also got the BOJ rate decision, but um, not expecting any fireworks there. They're expected to refrain from any policy adjustments. And so keeping rates at minus 0.1% and their QQE with yield curve control likely to be maintained uh, the 10-year JGB, JGB yield rate of 0%. Then the final thing to mention, if I just jump on my Twitter account, because I was sharing some of this um, over the weekend, is here, as you can see, US earnings season starts kicking off this week. And so what are we expecting? Well, from a top level point of view, US earnings season, uh, the S&P 500 is likely to report the highest earnings growth in more than 10 years in Q2. Remember, US GDP is expected to accelerate into the high single digit teens. So that in itself, the kind of further unlocking of the economy should see uh, with yields having moved as well higher in those points to be interested to see how, how banks have performed over that period. Um, during the upcoming week, 26 S&P 500 companies reporting that includes four of the major Dow components. And as you can see on this, this graphic, the key ones we're looking out for in, in very much a traditional fashion is nothing really today. And then you get JP Morgan um, on Tuesday before market. And then you get Bank of America, Wells Fargo City coming out pre-market Wednesday, Morgan Stanley Thursday. So uh, as I said, in typical fashion, the US big banks will kick things off and JP and GS first on that list on Tuesday uh, to be aware of. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So I'm going to leave it there. Let you guys get on with the day. Um, more technical charts and, and chat will be shared by Tim on the live stream in the Amplify Live community. So do remember to check that out. Otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, just remember to hit the like and subscribe button. Really appreciate it. And have a great week ahead. Thanks very much.